on this edition of Native Report. We attend a fine art photography exhibit of the late Edward Curtis. We visit the Stockbridge Muncie Reservation and learn about the history of the community. And we interview person, elder statesman really and former Vice President it. Walter it's Mondale. Works. We also learn something new about Indian Country and hear from our elders on this Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Mittawakanton Sioux Community and the Blandin Foundation. Welcome to Native Report, I'm Stacy Thunder. Ethnographer Edward Curtis is best known for his portrait photography of Native peoples across Indian Country during the early 20th century, who also cataloged their daily life. An exhibit of Curtis's iconic prints, reproduced by collector Christopher Cardozo, convey the beauty, heart, and spirit of his work. Patrons of the Hennepin County Library in downtown Minneapolis had the opportunity to view Beauty, Heart, and Spirit, the sacred legacy of Edward S. Curtis and the North American Indian, an exhibit of acclaimed and stunning portraits. The idea of the exhibit is really to honor and celebrate the sacred legacy, the beauty, heart, and spirit that was created by Edward Curtis and his native collaborators and co-creators a hundred years ago and it is this wonderful record which most people only know through the photographs which of course we're seeing here but Curtis also created 10,000 wax cylinder recordings of language and music thousands of pages of anthropological text he did the first film footage ever done on Native Americans and the first feature film ever created on Native Americans as well as 40 to 50,000 negatives so we are seeing a highly, highly selected group of his images. Uh, this exhibit in other forms has gone to every continent but Antarctica, 40 countries, over 100 venues, and ironically, we've never brought it back here. Cardozo discovered Curtis's work after a friend noticed similarities in Cardozo's own sepia-toned photographs of Native people in a remote Mexican village. Just after I graduated from the University of Minnesota in photography and film, a professor of mine asked me to go to a remote town in southern Mexico to help him uh, work on a film that he was going to do. I ended up in a tiny Indian village, uh, 200 people in the village and a few hundred people scattered around it. So I, I ended up spending six months there and did over 10,000 photographs and film footage and some sound recordings and it was uh, an incredible, extraordinary experience, the likes of which I have never had again. Within days of learning who Curtis was, Cardozo bought his first print and has been collecting ever since. He's become known as the world's leading authority on Curtis's life and work. Yes, this is a wonderful self-portrait of him in 1899 when he was 31 years old. And unfortunately, there was no color photography at the time. So even in this self-portrait, you get that sense of lighting and composition that were so critical to all his work in, 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 in the, at this period and in the future. He created a record with his Native American part participants that is unequaled anything we've ever seen in the world. Uh, he was lucky enough to have Teddy Roosevelt, who is then president, become his great champion, and that led him to an introduction to J.P. Morgan, the wealthiest man in the world, who became his lead patron. And Curtis had a vision, and there's a wonderful quote by Curtis, it's such a big dream, I can't see it all. And this was this idea at the beginning of a 30-year project that he wanted to create a record for us of who these people had been in the 1700s and the 1600s before significant contact with Europeans, how they had really lived. In 1899, 
Curtis joined the Harriman Alaska Expedition. And in 1900, he traveled to the Southwest, where he photographed the Hopi and Navajo peoples. He knew that if he didn't do this, if he didn't make the sound recordings, the film, the photographs, the, the anthropological text, these, we would not know who these people were. We would not know what their culture was. And he, I think, was absolutely right. We, we know things, and perhaps as importantly, we see things and feel things through the photographs that we otherwise never would have. From the very beginning, there's been controversy about Curtis's work. Initially, there were many noted scientists who were really jealous that Curtis was getting all this money and J.P. Morgan was funding him and Teddy Roosevelt loved him. And he had to go in front of a committee at the Smithsonian, a very unfriendly committee, to justify his work. And he passed with flying colors. His photographs, to me, when people criticize him saying that they're too romantic or that he staged or posed things, is both missing the point and is very unfair. Curtis himself clearly stated what he was trying to do with the photographs was to give us an idea of who these people really were in their essence, who they were before significant contact with outsiders. Curtis was a technical genius. He not only was very gifted artistically and had a very clear aesthetic that he followed throughout his entire 30-year career, but he was a gifted, gifted photographic technician. And he printed in at least six different photographic processes. Curtis worked in, and we have recreated his work, in platinum prints, silver prints, gum bichromate prints, gold tone prints. Uh, we do a contemporary print process. Uh, we also incorporate some vintage photogravures in the collection. So it's, it's an incredible body of work. And Curtis's original work is our template. That is our starting point. So tell us about the gold tones. Well, gold tone is a process that Curtis really pioneered. We don't think he invented it, but he pioneered and popularized it over 100 years ago. Curtis discovered that he could take a glass plate that would have, in his day, would have been used as a negative and make a print on it. And then he used a mixture of different metal powders that would be a gold color. They were sprayed onto the back of this glass. You then had, a, obviously, a clear glass positive. It's extraordinarily beautiful, and it was what Curtis was most known for. They were actually, at the time, called Kirktones. And Scott Mamaday wrote about how moved he was looking at a particular Curtis photograph, and that he felt that he was home for the first time, and it turned out it was actually a photograph of his people. And to me, the fact that here we are today, 105 and 10 years later, looking at images that I've seen people move to tears by on three continents, I think speaks to the fact that he, he knew what he was doing and he, he, he did it the right way. Did you know that Edward Sheriff Curtis took over 40,000 photographs of native peoples from over 80 different Indian tribes? In 1885, at the age of 17, Curtis became an apprentice photographer in St. Paul, Minnesota. In 1906, J.P. Morgan provided Curtis with funding to produce a 20-volume work with 1,500 photographs. Curtis worked with an anthropologist from the Smithsonian Institution and also produced over 10,000 wax cylinder recordings of Indian languages. In his work entitled The North American Indian, Curtis also published biographies of tribal leaders, histories, and the traditions of many Indian nations. Next. The Stockbridge Muncie Band of Mohican Indians were originally located on the eastern seaboard. But over the years, they were pushed from their homelands and forced to uproot and move many times to their present home in east central Wisconsin. Their story is one of community and resiliency.
On the summer day, the Arvid E. Miller Museum and Library is the ideal setting as Stockbridge Muncie President Robert Chicks discusses the history of the reservation. The tribe has uh, known by uh, various names over various periods of time, but we are, um, we are Mohicans. Uh, we are, I guess, legally called the Stockbridge Muncie Band of Mohican Indians, but uh, we, are, uh, we are the Mohicans, which not to be confused with the Mohicans from Connecticut. Um, if you think about the present day capital of New York is Albany. Well, Albany was also the uh, traditional historical capital of the Mohican Nation. And um, by reference, when Henry Hudson, uh, like in 1609, came up what is now the, called the Hudson River, uh, it was uh, the Mohicans he met um, uh, right in the Albany area. So that was where uh, our ancestors um, uh, said they hung the fireplace, the center of the nation. Those ancestral lands were lost as the Europeans encroached ever more into native territories. And after being forced to move several times, the band were settled near Lake Winnebago. But the state and federal governments had other ideas. Apparently, uh, the state wanted that land and they were going to try to move us then further west to Minnesota in uh, a few of our uh, leaders back then went to Minnesota, came back and said no. Uh, so in 1856, uh, through a treaty between the United States and the Menominee, uh, Menominee Nation, they um, ceded you know, a, uh, an area that's roughly two townships to the federal government who in turn then signed a treaty with us. And so in 1856, the reservation here was officially established. This is a representation of Stockbridge Muncie community. This is our reservation boundaries. It is the full two townships. We're located in Shawano County in the t two townships of Bartlemy and Red Springs. And the, the primary focus for the reacquisition of these lands in the northern tier is forestry. Housing development and any business development will be down in the southern half where it's less forested. Like many Native nations, the past is not the past for the Stockbridge Muncie, as traditions are kept very much alive in the present. One is the honoring of their nation's veterans. I think it's fairly well established and, and maybe not well known that as a percentage of the population, American Indians tend to um, uh, have a, a greater percentage of their members in service than, than any other group of people. Um, we have uh, a huge um, uh, veterans uh, organization, the Weekend Veterans, and um, they have uh, a, a place down by our health center where uh, there's a wall with the names of all the, you know, the veterans going all the way back to uh, pre-revolutionary times, I would guess, and um, uh, and so there's a great honor among all tribes. Uh, the, the warrior uh, was uh, uh, really held in, in high regard. About two years ago, um, since this, this is the anniversary of the Civil War, um, a woman in Shano, which is a town close by, put an article in the paper and listed a lot of names of Civil War soldiers. And my great-great-grandfather was on that list. And then I found out his brother was also in the Civil War. So she gave me some information. They had a ceremony in the cemetery in Shano to rededicate some of the headstones that were missing. And there were 80 soldiers that, they, that re, were rededicated. Of all those soldiers, I believe, there must have been, I, I knew my great-great-grandfather and his brother were there, but on some of the names you could see there were Menominees and there were other tribal people there. I did articles in the paper to find information from our tribal membership. 
uh, and I came up with 58 uh, Stockbridge Muncie men who were in the Civil War and five brother town Indians who were married to Stockbridge women. And so I, I'm sure I have more to go through, but it's been um, just amazing. President Chicks, and by extension the Tribal Council, is committed to ensuring there are opportunities for the enrolled membership of the Stockbridge Muncie Band. I'm very humbled by it always, and to think that uh, your tribal members are in, in effect investing all of their history in, in you know, the members who serve on the Tribal Council is a very humbling thought. And so you take that with you every night to the pillow and hope that um, uh, you're always doing the best to make sure that the next generation is here and the generation after that, and still making sure that there are the basics uh, for um, the safety and welfare of your, of your current tribal members. And it's a big challenge. Um, there is a, a symbol uh, called the Many Trails, uh, and it symbolizes uh, the, the many sort of kind of directions and trails it took for us to get here and you can see different things in looking at that symbol. Um, certainly you'd be able to see the struggle and, and the difficulties, but you'd also see, also see the recognition of Christianity. And, uh, there are a number of churches on our reservation, uh, but, uh, but there's also the resurgence of the native culture and there's no reason that anywhere that you know there can't be coexistence and so it takes some time take some time for uh, for for a cultural group to kind of re go through that metamorphosis and and remember uh, the strength and the wonder of, of what it means to to be a Mohican person Eagle feathers are important to tribes all across the country in that we honor the spirit of the eagle and various, various tribes have different stories about why that's so. And, but in general, uh, you know, the eagle has interceded on our behalf with the creator and is a messenger and we honor those feathers as part of that, uh, that uh, role that that eagle played in our, in, in our cultural history. And so the, uh, you know, the eagle feathers are, are honored the, with the veterans in the various tribes and they're a mark of esteem and a mark of honor as a, when they're gifted either from the bird or from uh, gifted by, you know, by one of the veterans to, uh, to people who've earned that honor. And they're used in our ceremonies. We don't think of them as property because they're a sacred gift that we, we don't own. We're stewards of them and we know that eventually they will go to someone else. And when they go on to someone else, we know that that's, uh, that's part of our, our cultural heritage, so that they're not property in that respect. Next, Tad Johnson sits down with Vice President Walter Mondale, who worked on major state and federal legislation in the 60s and 70s that positively impacted Native nations. He was also one of few who spoke out against injustice, inequality, and how the United States viewed Native America. Sitting in his office at the Minneapolis law firm of Dorsey & Whitney, Vice President Walter Mondale reflects on the lessons his father taught him as a boy growing up and how he applied those lessons to his years of public service. 
What I did learn was from my dad how we owe every person respect. Every person is a child of God and that whenever we discriminate against people, it's a sin. And I kind of went into politics with that idea and still have it. I was convinced that, that, the, that, the, that the Indians had been unfairly treated and that uh, we need, there's a lot of justice work that needed to be done. And the more I got into it, the more I became persuaded that big reforms were needed. As Attorney General from Minnesota and later as a United States Senator, he was able to reform Indian policy. Along the way, he made friends with many tribal leaders, most notably the Red Lake Nation chairman, the late Roger Jourdain. Roger was my buddy. We would talk serious policy and he'd come out to Washington um, and I would see him there or I would see him in Minneapolis or I'd see him up in Red Lake. Whenever he came to Washington, he always had a place in the White House with me. And I remember he brought uh, some high school kids from Red Lake to, and they wanted to dance somewhere. So we set up a platform out of the White House lawn there and the president came out with me and we watched them dance and they, we, we did our best to help. The 1960s and 70s were a time of change on many fronts, including Indian country. This was a time which I think was, it, it looks very good in American history, when there, there was a bunch of young progressive senators. You may have named a couple of them, Bobby and Teddy, but I think there were a lot of people of like mind like myself there that wanted to correct things in America that needed adjustment. And one was this idea of what I call paternalism, where Indians were, could only function if they were under guardianship. If they would get money, it ought to be under trusteeship. If, um, the, if there was education, somehow there had to be a bureau there or somebody else overseeing the education. The idea that Indians could be just as capable of handling their affairs, just as interested in their children and their future as the rest of us, had not yet, it was not dawning as quickly as it should. I can remember, don't want to use names here, <clears throat> when we started making these changes, an old older senator, nice man, uh, and he said, you know, are you sure you're going down the right path? Do you, you think they're ready? Uh, to do this for themselves, don't you think we should wait until they're better prepared? And I said, you know, I think, I think we've held on way too long. I think that they, they're just as capable of figuring out their lives as we non-Indians are. As a senator, Walter Mondale sat on the Senate Subcommittee on Indian Education and helped to pass the landmark Indian Education Act of 1972. We worked very hard on that committee, and we traveled a lot around the country. We had a lot of hearings. We introduced legislation on the Indian Education Act, which passed, and the theory of the new act was parental control, local control, uh, teaching materials that fit children and their histories, that uh, where, where children, when they read it, can see things about themselves that uh, strengthen their sense of self-worth. Every child needs that. Other key pieces of legislation followed during the Carter administration. One that had a great impact was the Tribally Controlled Community College Assistance Act of 1978. That's one of the most exciting things. Um, if you go to Fond du Lac, you have a community college there. It's one of the best in the country. In all, and I think we have a couple other locations in Minnesota. Uh, there's 70 Indian community colleges now in the country. There was a period of eight or 10 years there when the American public were electing people 
there was Lyndon Johnson with all of his problems, but Lyndon was good on this stuff, and um, Hubert Humphrey, of course, and and a progressive court with Earl Warren, and and it was a time for real change. You know that whole idea of opportunity and dignity and mercy. That that was the keystone of that era that I talked about. And wherever you went, people were trying to do something to improve lives. A lot of good was done. For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, look for us at nativereport.org and Facebook. Thank you for spending time with us here at Native Report. I'm Stacy Thunder. We'll see you next time. Stacy Thunder is a member of and legal counsel for the Red Lake Nation, and Tad Johnson is a member of the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa, and is chair for the American Indian Studies Department on the campus of the University of Minnesota Duluth. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Mittawakanton Sioux Community and the Blandin Foundation.